Let's look first at an explanation <coughs> of reading it should be it should be reading two, not reading three, it should be reading two sets and systems, the beginning of it at least. Okay. And it starts with the reference accents, the two reference accents, RP and General American. And we can just sort of look at half of this as we're going through it, if you like. I don't know if you've got it on your screens, those of you who've got it on your screens here. It talks about the difference between the two. Uh, and it gives these pictures when we get to it. Um, the difference between the vowel systems of RP here, and here's what I want to talk about, this, this picture here, the vowel systems of e RP and the vowel systems of General American. Now this looks a little bit daunting, but I, it's very easy to get in your mind if you look at it closely. Here we go. This is the two vowel systems that uh, he is talking about. And he puts the vowel systems of any accent of English, he puts them into four boxes, as you can see here. Let's look at the top one, which is the, uh, which is RP. Okay. And he splits them into, first, the checked vowels. Uh, that perhaps should be a picture like the vowel chart that we've done with this line down, up and down here. But he puts them into squares to make it easier. Okay, These are the checked vowels. If you remember, that means the lax vowels. The vowels that have to occur with a consonant at the end of the <coughs> word. They can't occur free at the end of the word. So those are the lax vowels, kit, dress, trap, strut, uh, lot, and foot, the short, lax vowels, okay? The other three are the free vowels, the vowels that can occur at the end of a word, and those are the tense vowels, and he puts them into three groups always. The first group is the top, the, the upper forward group, okay? Tense, um, uh, close vowels and forward. That is to say, fleece and the three diphthongs that move up towards fleece, actually towards kit. They're the vowels that move in that direction or are in that direction. E, A, OI, and I. In the fourth box, we have the second group of free vowels, and that is the, the vowels which move to the back the close back vowels. You've got goose, which is there all the time, goose, and the two diphthongs which move in that direction, o and ow. Okay? And he puts them this side, but actually they should be, it's, 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 it, he's just making a systematic position, positioning here. O and ow, if you think of them, o should be more here, shouldn't it, moving in that direction, and ow should be, should be more here, moving in this direction, but it makes it easier to see. And the final group is the third group of three vowels, and those are the central vowels, uh, sorry, those are the open vowels, all the open vowels, and the diphthongs which move towards schwa. And that is the group, if you remember, that gives you intrusive R and linking R when they come at the end of a word. All these, these vowels uh, in RP, want an R after them at the end of the word. So, uh, R, car, the car is, uh, or, law, law is, er, uh, stir, stir up, ear, uh, fear, the fear of it, air, er, care, the care of it, and ur, pure, um, pure American. Okay, with this r always. So, and this distinction, this four-way distinction of all the vowels, these sets, are ones which work for all the native dialects. 
You can see the distinction here between this is the RP distinction and this is the general American system, which is a little bit different. There's no lot, for instance, in the general American system. The free, the free vowels rising to the front are all the same. The vowels rising to the back are not quite the same. You've got ow, but instead of o, you've got o, a diphthong, o here, and o. And notice he doesn't put the two dots here. He doesn't put the two dots because, if you remember, general American doesn't have the same distinction of length. And finally, there are no centering diphthongs in American because the r is always there anyway. So, er uh, in fur. Ah in shah, car, or in law or law. Okay? And that is the general, that is the main distinction. But if you can remember these four positions here, keep this in our mind for the moment. We won't be going back to Wells until the, 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 seventh, the eighth week. We won't be going back to general American until the eighth week. We'll look at this and see how the English accents differ from this here. Okay? Is that making sense? I know it sounds very complicated um, and it means a lot of sort of thought. Give yourself time to look at that and puzzle out yourself what he's talking about. Uh, and listen to me again on the tape because um, it's always good to listen to this later. So here uh, on page 120 and page 121-22 he gives the, the sets in RP English with the pronunciations in RP English. The same sets in General American and it will give you the same sets in Scottish for instance but there will be different vowels. So these are the vowels that we all remember from RP I, E, A, O, A, U, A, O and U. Uh. You notice though one thing here he's got two O vowels. This is interesting. He's got the lot set and he's got the cloth set. Two sets there. And they both have O in American in RP. But if you look at American you've got the lot set which has not O but it should be more like A here. Lot. I'm not sure why he puts that there. Lot. he got lot here. But he's got cloth. Lot and cloth. Americans have two positions here. Usually lot is the same as palm. Lot and palm have fallen together, but cloth may be different. Sometimes cloth is the same as lot. It's quite complicated in American. So you get cloth and lot and palm all the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, and I'm a bit surprised why he... I think this may be a misprint here in his book. It may be that he should have this, vowel, this one here. Lot. There are American dialects which have lot, make a distinction between palm and lot, but not many. I think that's a misprint. Now, wait a minute. That's a very, very good question. Um, the name... Now you see the reason for the names of the sets. Because this gives you the pronunciation, but this gives you the name of the sets, and they may have different pronunciations in different dialects. Do you see? So the lot vowels are still there. The lot set is still there, but it doesn't have the lot vowel. It has an R vowel. And I should change this, make it an R here. I've got a feeling that's a misprint. Okay? For instance, the nurse vowels, when we get to Scotland, all the nurse words split up into a lot of different groups because you've got nurse and, and, and you've got ward and um, work and a herd and university, all the nurse words split up into different groups. I was just wondering, with the story, is that one of the few that has the rolling one? Yeah, yeah, it does. Wait till we get to Scotland, Scottish. We'll take a bit of time over Scottish, it's nice. 
But if you see, for instance, uh, we, the thing is that we use the same sets in all dialects. Okay? You see, for instance, we've got trap and bath here in RP. Trap and bath. In American, we've got trap and bath, but bath has the same vowel as trap. It's, tra it's bath. Trap and bath. So we stick to these different groups because they may be different in some dialects, they may be the same in others. Okay, does that make sense? Think of these as being think of these as being groups of words which have the same vowel in every single dialect but may have different vowels in different dialects. That's why we keep trap and bath in GA even though it's the same here. Even though it is the same, yeah. Because in fact there are one or two American dialects, old American dialects, which still do make the distinction, but not the same. They may say trap and bath with a long air. And so you keep it because even though there are different dialects, they still um, refer to this. Yeah. We want this we want this set, it's the same set in both types, we want this set, one set for every dialect. And then we say, how are the trap words spoken in this dialect, pronounced in this dialect? And you can see here, you've got, um, let's put that right and turn this round. Lot would be the same as palm. Okay? But here, cloth, uh, in some dialects you'll find that's also cloth. Cloth, lot, and, and thart, and palm. Thart and cloth can be different in some dialects. Okay? In English it's different. Cloth and thought cloth and thought. And you can see, although we have the same vowel in English here, in, 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 in RP, although we have the same vowel in RP for north and thought, in American you might, you'll have north and thought. And then you've got force, 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 which has a different vowel. In English, it's all the same vowel. So that's why we have these different, some, some more uh, uh, sets than we used for RP. But, but not in some dialects of English? No. Yeah. Me, most dialects have, have several of these together as one. For instance, for instance uh, bath and trap is the same in American. But we keep them separate because we want to be able to point out that it's bath and trap. In. And then you ask which word is which word is a, which a new word is it a trap word or is it a is it a bath word? How many have you got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three nines are twenty-seven. You've got twenty-seven there different sets, and it's always the same twenty-seven different sets. Okay, a vowels. I can promise you that this, getting this into your head, is simply a question of working at it, giving yourself time. You've got to give yourself quite a bit of time at the beginning of the term to get these ideas in your head. Just look at through them, just read this again and again, and uh, we'll be continually look, using them as we, go through the, as we go through the class, listening to the different, different vowels. And, of course, in this class, it's not going to be so much a question of memorizing. That's not so important. I mean, many of these things I can't remember, but I know where to go into the book and find them. Okay? And when you're doing exercises, you'll have the material, because it, I won't give you an examination, it'll be a home assignment, you'll have the material to look it up. So that you can go into the book, or you can go into this, this thing and say, okay, yes, strut has this vowel here it has this vowel here in north, that's RP in northern England, strut has a different vowel, it has this vowel it has the foot vowel, where's the foot? it has the foot vowel here, strut and foot ok, the only place where it does so have these things with you and as you're listening to the text as you're listening to the different pronunciations and you're seeing things which are different uh, 
go back to the sets and see where are they in this set, why is it like this, and you, there'll always be questions, you, things you don't understand. That's the point of this, that's the point of linguistics in general. The areas that, you, that don't seem to make sense to you, the areas that don't seem to make sense to you, believe you me, there are many areas in all linguistic systems which still don't make sense to me. And they are the areas where, um, where uh, my books are, are getting a bit grotty because I'm keeping going back to them to try and, and more and more, you're getting over more and more, understanding more and more as I go on. Things that you have to, 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 to look at again. And then uh, on page, on page uh, 123, the same thing happening. This is the same, these same lexical sets, but he's put them together in the stand, because of the standard lexical sets. The 20, he's only got 24 here. Did I miscount them before? Three nines are 27. I don't know why. He's got 24 here. Um, these are the standard lexical sets. Uh, and um, <coughs> you can see here is the RP accent and the general American accent. And if you really want to be good to yourself, you can write this up and add other accents as you come to them. How does the Scot what does the Scottish accent look like there? What does the North of England accent? What does the Australian accent look like there? What does the Irish accent look like there? Add to them. Check the index here. This says one. Uh, these are sounds which have an R following before a vowel only so that in RP it has an R following only if a vowel occurs next. The same here with start, north and force. Okay. And we can get rid of this now because I don't want to look. That's the, the first two or three pages of uh, the vowel systems there. Read it through and, and check it out. But don't spend a lot of time looking at the system, the, the, the American systems. Those, that's not important at the moment. If you go on, you'll find that he gives two vowel systems compared. You can go through that. Forget that. But this is a very important sheet for you to look at later because here you've got on page 127 the standard lexical sets and he talks in detail about all the standard sets beginning with kit, talks about it, read it through uh, and what is important is that it will give you lists, very useful lists. Here's for instance the list for dress the dress list and you can see that most of them are written with an E okay but not all of them here they're written with an EA bread dead and so on all the different different types of here's one written with a U berry okay um, and as we go on here's the here's the lot set mostly written with an O but sometimes written with an A swan quality yacht wasp, watch, squabble, okay. The strut set is very interesting because you've got there these two types of spelling in the strut set which you remember before. Um, no, have I lost it? Strut, why doesn't he it goes straight on to Bath. Oh, to the, to the left. oh uh, it's here. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so we need to go over to. Yeah, we need to go over to. The strut vowel here, probably. There you go. Here, the strut vowels and you can see most of the, the, the typical ones are written with you cut, cut, suck much and so on but halfway down we sometimes suddenly get into the ones which are written with O, done, come, love mother, stomach tough, enough, blood flood and so on those are the strut vowels and remember these will all be 
foot be like the foot vowels, strat and foot fall together. They will be cup, cut, such, monk, touch, blood, and flood in the in the north of, of the country. So this is a very, very important reading for you for you to check up when you're not sure of what a certain set is, what the pronunciation is, go into that reading. I should have it printed out and have it with you and check up what that set is and what he says about that set. Okay. How are we doing for time? We've come to the end of this 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 thing now. Should we have a five minute break? Uh, ten minute break? Seven minute break? Okay. While I fit up the rest of this stuff and we can look at we'll resume the recording. We'll start this again. And we'll say take take two. So if I ever put these two things together I have them in the right place. And now what I want to do really is to look at uh, reading three developments and processes which looks horrible, these horrible words, residualism. But I'm going to take, um, I don't really think you're going to need to read reading three very closely because I'm pretty, pretty well all on um, this PowerPoint show. And I think we can probably go through most of it on the PowerPoint show. What do we mean by processes? Why on earth do these people have to use such complicated words? a very simple thing. I think what we're thinking of is that if you, as, as we said before, if you've got two dialects with two different things happening in this dialect, let's just take south of England and north of England again and we talk about foot and strut in the south of England and foot and strut in the north of England. It's obvious that somewhere or other there's been a change in the history, hasn't it? In the south of England, either the foot and strut words have split into two, or in the north of England, the foot and strut words have fallen, merged into one. Okay? So that when we're talking about this variable, we can talk about it as foot strut split or foot strut, strut merge. And foot strut split is what has happened. They have split in the south into two different forms. So processes, we're talking about changes, historical changes, which have left their mark on the language. This is all that's happening. A process then is a historical change which has left its mark on the language. Come in. Is it uh, with a service? Or like, how, how can you check that it's uh, split and not merge? How can you check that it's a... Uh, a split and not a merge? Okay, all right. How can we check that? Um, First of all, you can check it by believing what I say. <laughs> okay. Secondly, I think there are so many things which point to the fact that if we take a word like cup and butcher, spelling tells us an awful amount, doesn't it? Spelling must be historical. Cup, butcher, and we can go back to the way it was spelt. 500 years ago, 600 years ago, we can go back to it. We, we have the, 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 the we have it in, in manuscripts, and the fact that it's written with the same syllable, the same sound, seems to point to when they started writing it, they had the same sound. Okay, we can also see as as w uh, the way words rhyme. For instance, in Chaucer, he has rhyming. See which words rhyme together, and cup would also would, um, would, would have this ah, would have this oop sound and would rhyme with other things. Um, that's, I think, the way we do it. When we're talking about processes, we're talking about modern English, and we can split them up into two things. We can split them up into processes which are finished. Okay, it's all changed. And we can split them up into processes which are still going on. All right? Uh, let's look at that 
look at some complete processes which we can forget processes which have happened in every single dialect of English for instance a thing called consonant singling you can forget about it it means that when you've got a, a double consonant or a long consonant because it's pr pr uh, spelt d, d it probably was once upon a time pronounced lad with a long d there but that doesn't happen anymore all the double consonants in English are now short not latter or written but latter and written so double consonant singling is something which has happened in every single dialect of English it's very old running and following now it's only a spelling thing that you have to remember okay uh, and uh, but it was once run running and follow but now it's running and follow another complete process is that kn and gn the k the k and the g has dropped off there's no dialect of english where we still say kno kni or gnat yeah it didn't used to be knicht yeah knicht that's right knicht night would have been knicht okay so wherever there's a k there it just shows that that is something which has dropped off knife for instance used to be kniv and that's why we still and, and it, that often corresponds to Icelandic doesn't it knivud that knife derived from your voice directly not actually um, that's very interesting with English you've got what happened is that you've got the English word knive and you've got the Norse word Nivr, and they're both the same. Oh, right. Okay, and they both ca came from a, 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 an older form, which have been something like, um, yeah, what would it have been? It would have been knivas, something like that. I'm not sure how that is. That would be an older form, which doesn't, which has never been. We haven't found written. It's an old Germanic form. It splits up into Old English. And this would turn then into. Didn't it have a K then? Yes, I'm sorry. Here it would have been written like that. Kniv. It would have written with a C. Okay. Yes. Uh, and probably in older versions of Norse it would have been written with a K. Okay. Same with knee and so on. We still have this, we still show this in modern English today, which is so stupid because it hasn't been pronounced now for more than 600 years, but we still put it there. Okay? Uh, one of the problems of English spelling, one of the things which help us to understand when we're talking about dialects is English spelling because it shows the pronunciation 400 years ago. This is what we, uh, 600 years ago. We must never remember, forget that. But the spelling shows us the actual pronunciation of Chaucer's time. So when you get a word like knife and you've learned all these complicated rules in modern English, don't pronounce the K at the beginning of N. If you've got an E here and an E there, don't pronounce the E but turn the E into I. So complicated. So you've probably forgotten them such a long time ago that you learnt them. You were learning these when you first learnt English. Horrible rules to learn. But if you said this as it's written, knive, knive, that would have been Chaucer's pronunciation. That's how he said it. And the words, the pronunciation has changed, but the spelling hasn't. Uh, both very annoying and very useful. So those are complete processes which you can forget about, but just remember they may explain some strange spelling things in English. Let's look at some incomplete processes which are still going on or may have stopped before they finished. One of them is the foot strut split. What happened there was that... Uh, you've, let's look at them. We've got butch, put much, stuff, love, country, cushion, 
discussion, and it's very difficult to know which is which, isn't it? Why, why butch but much? Why cushion but rush, for instance? Now, what was obviously happening there was that what happened that was that the foot vowel started to change into a strut vowel in certain words. And if that process had gone on, all the foot words would have changed into strut words. But for some reason, it went halfway through and stopped. So it's an incomplete process, and now we've got the situation where some words are foot words, some words are strut words. In the north of England, that didn't happen at all. They all stayed foot words. So there's an incomplete split. Another incomplete split is the bath trap split, which interestingly is almost the same area wherever foot strut split occurs in the north of England, uh, in the south of England, so bath trap also split. All right? And again, why is it a split and not a merger, as Camille asked us? <coughs> Quite clearly, you can see by the spelling that that must have been the same vowel. And in the north of England, it is the same vowel. They have bath, not a, but a, like the Icelandic a in madur, bath, math, pas, mas, okay. Whereas in the south, uh, the words began to change over into r. Actually, it's a very complicated process there. What happened was they lengthened first so that bath started to lengthen to bath, bath, with the same vowel but along same quality, math but bath, pass but mas, okay. And in some parts of uh, the world, you can still see the difference between them, but it's only a distance in difference in length. And then what happens is that the long form starts going into R. So now I say bath, math, pass, mass. And that is a, a split, which is, because it's a split, it means it hasn't gone all the way through. Not all the words have gone through that process. I think really these two splits here are the most important for you to learn in English in, in the English of England this is also important for American and English because the bar trap split doesn't happen in America but the foot strut split does happen in America it also happens in Scotland so would that mean that the bath trap split happens? say bath bath thank you the bath trap split ok the bath trap split yeah yeah uh, Whatever. Yeah. Would that mean that that split hadn't happened when uh, people were migrating to America? Right. Exactly that. Exactly that. When we come to it, you'll see it's a wee bit more complicated than that, but that's exactly that to begin. Actually, what had happened in America was that the it had begun to change. Bath and pass had begun to lengthen, so that the early Americans were saying bath and math. Actually, they probably had a there. Bath and math. That would be in the 17th century, 18th century. But what happened in America was that differences in length became unimportant, if you remember. So it sort of dropped out in America. Whereas in England, the differences in length became important and made the change of the vowel as well. So that's the sort of thing that happened. So but that but was a change that sort of went back. Right. And quite a few changes are regressive there are some changes which are regressive they begin and then they get out of favor and they disappear again that's quite common one of them is the old cloth lot split in England where my grandmother my grandfather not my grandmother but my grandfather always used to say uh, lot but cloth um, uh, pick the cloth up. Uh, he fell off the table. The book fell off the table instead of off the table. That was a split which was going on since about the 17th century and it's now completely disappeared in England. It's regressed, it's stopped, doesn't go, it's gone back again now. <coughs> now, <coughs> then Wells talks about residualisms. 
okay, residue, remains, leavings, leivad, eftistelvad, okay. And these are processes which are mostly completed but may leave traces in some dialects. These are processes which are really complete everywhere. But there are one or two little dialects here and there in England where you might still see that they are, they're incomplete. Residualisms then really only refer to one or two uh, traditional strange dialects. For instance, in some parts of Scotland, people, you might, people might still say tonight instead of tonight. Say nicht. And uh, actually, I think that's completely died out but the Scots sometimes use it when they're putting on a Scottish accent to make themselves sound different from the English when they're proud of their Scottish accent that's a bra bricht moonlicht nicht it's a wonderful bright moonlit night okay um, and uh, that, was in, that was all over Scotland about 100 years ago 200 years ago so let's look at some of these processes they're rather interesting some of them you remember the great vowel shift, you should remember that from, and we have to have to look at that I'm afraid, the great vowel shift from, from history of English, the shift which changes knife, eif to eif, which changes um, sweet to sweet, which changes hus to house and so on, the great vowel shift. That has happened everywhere in England and it's happened everywhere in the English speaking world except Scotland. And it's happened in Scotland too but it went a different way in one position in Scotland. So great vowel shift, although we look at it, it's something which has already happened. And we have to take that into our mind. I want you to learn the great vowel shift as well. You, if, you would, if you were doing history of the English language with me, I went into the great vowel shift fairly closely. I'm not sure that does it so quite so closely but it's something you probably should have learned in the history of the English language anyway you remember what I mean by the great vowel shift okay one is ng coalescence that is this fact that we write the word with an n and a g but we say it like this ng has moved together to make a mm sound. We say sing. Okay? If you like, what's happened is that the N has changed to ng in front of g, sing, and then g has dropped off and you get sing. And that's happened when ing occur at the end of any word in most dialects of English. It's just ing, ing, except in the West Midlands of England where people still say sing listen carefully to Jay he comes from there he doesn't do it very much because he's lived in Norway uh, he's lived, Norway. He's lived in, in London for such a long time and he speaks a more standard English but I sometimes pick him up when he's, particularly when he's annoyed it's good to make teachers annoyed and they speak their native dialect it's very good Try making Martin annoyed, he'll come up with real London. It's marvellous. So Jay does occasionally say sing, like Icelanders all do. Icelanders always put the g there and say sing. And he does occasionally say singing. So try singing in his class and see whether he says, Stop that singing! With a g there. All right? That's something that has dropped out everywhere except in the west part of the middle. The velar fricative. That's the sound in words like a braabricht munlicht nicht. That's the sound that we now write with a gh. Words like thought, night, taught. Okay, that's dropped out pretty well everywhere. But it did quite a few strange things before it dropped out to English. 
if you think of this, this in Old English was socht. This was nicht. And this was tacht. Okay? And by the time we got into Middle English, it was probably written something like this. Thucht. They used a, 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 a symbol here which is dropped out of English. A, a, it's called yog. It's called Y-O-G-H. Yog. Thucht. And very soon it started when Caxton came along and started printing English. He took his printing press from... from, from um, from the continent, from Germany. He hadn't got a yog in his printing press, so he started writing GH instead. And that's why we have it. And he hadn't got thought, so he started writing TH instead. That's why we have thought today. But Chaucer would have still said thought. Thought. It's interesting that the, these old spelling systems in English, is the old looked like that and it changed into this into modern English uh, they couldn't be produced when the printing press came in when the first printing press came in and that's why we that's why we lost them okay that's the Vila fricative and that's gone everywhere except in some very traditional northern English and Scottish accents the long mid mergers doesn't that sound horrible? Huh. What do we do when we find something horrible? We go to the dialects mid page, we go to the variables, we go down until we get the long mid mergers. And they're not very important. They only occur in some parts of the British Isles. They occur with the face and the goat vowel. How on earth, what do we mean by them? Look at them the long mid mergers so are you saying these the, the long mid merger, merger change only occurred in the no the they changed they changed everywhere everywhere except except in these areas here an area in the north of England you can see on the map an area here an area in East Anglia and an area in Newfoundland way over here in America it's the only places that they didn't change. And the distinction is, and you can, it's, it, you can see it in the spelling. It's rather nice. If you look at the word like, if you look at words like days and days, everywhere these are pronounced the same. But the spelling should be showing you something. The spelling should be telling you once upon a time they were not pronounced the same. Are there any places left in the world where they're still not pronounced the same? And there are. In Wales, for instance, some places in the north, you get here, you get days and days. So where it hasn't occurred in these few places, you'll get a distinction between them. Days and days. The same places, you get the same distinction between nose and nose between this nose and this nose okay it's a distinction between them that's that occurs in that occurs in in southern in southern in the english speaking parts of wales <coughs> nose and nose and nose um, and I've forgotten which one is which. I better put this in here. Yes, okay, nose and nose. Okay, this is nose and this is nose. This is days and this is days. Okay, and it's called, they're called the long mid diphthongs because 
here we go again there's a long mid vowels a long vowels in the middle this long e and this long o have changed into first of all this has changed into o and then into o and this has changed into a everywhere Uh, uh, this what happens here is that nose changes first to nose and then later it changes to nose and this is called this is called um, goat fronting that's another change that happens so you can still hear it uh, it changed in the south of England nose but in many places in, in America they still say nose O and O okay that's another change here uh, listen to them you can you can you should be able to, to days days nose nose okay you can hear them there if we just if we just try and I, if, if I turn it up everything will go mad but you can just hear it there uh, 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 in your own computer you can make it higher than that another way you can do this perhaps is to is to download this okay while I'm talking about that let me just point out to you that on these pages where you can listen to them. Uh, I have two different types of page. Some of them have a little red speaker here, uh, which means that you pick that and then you have to wait to download it and it may go into another program to play it. Okay. Some of them I put it straight into the into the, the web page, which means the web page itself might take a longer time to load. Okay. And I'll show you that when we get to diphthong shift. So if we go back here, that's what to do, that's what we need to do when we get into something that we don't really understand. And you see I went in there simply because I couldn't for the moment in the in the heat of the moment. I couldn't remember what long mid mergers were. And I mean this is quite normal. You've got a lot of things in your mind and I couldn't remember which one the long mid mergers were, so I had to go into this to remind myself. It's what you have to do all the time. I don't expect people to be able to know what long mid mergers are. Fleece merger is another one. It's not important. But you'll find that in some parts of the country, if you take words like um, feed no that's E isn't it what I want is a word like uh, why don't we look at the fleece merger and I'll find the right words for you ok look at the fleece merger here where is the fleece merger it's not very important ok middle of the north of England and I haven't got it there ok it's words spelt with ok here I remember it now meat and meat it's a word spelt with E-A and E-E -E. in some parts of the north of England I must remember to put this in because it's an interesting thing here you've got you've got um, meat and meat meat and meat you can hear the distinction it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not very important to you, but you will sometimes hear it. When you hear that, if you can hear that distinction, then go into it and you'll find here, middle, north of England. Okay? So those are, res those are typical residualisms, and I think we only need to take those five. They may show uh, old perhaps dying, perhaps dead accents in England, but you might still find speakers doing it. Let's look at then some of these quickly. The great vowel shift is perhaps the one that we have to think most about. Do we go on until 10 minutes past? Yeah. Okay. We'll just take time looking at the great vowel shift here, and I'm going back into the history of the English language um, just to remind you of what 
happens in the great vowel shift. Here is the pronunciation up to about 1450. So Chaucer, who's 1400, would have had the pure vowels here. In words like here, he would have said team, sweet, clan, name, stone, stone, mourn, and he would probably have said hoos, although it's a strange spelling here. It would have been written oo. In, in Old English, it would have been written oo. So there he has the, he has the, um, the pure vowels. The great vowel shift began to occur about 1450, and it went on until about 1600, Shakespeare's time. Shakespeare was much further into it than we had. He was beginning to say, tame. Now we say time. Perhaps he said, tame. Tame, the tame. He would have said, sweet, instead of sweet. He would have said, clean. He would have said, clean, instead of clan. Clean, instead of clan. What's happening is the vowels are moving up, aren't they? And let's look at it again. If we look at the next one. You can see that. He would have said nam instead of nam. He would have said stone. No, stone instead of stone. And he would have said moon instead of moon. And for house, he would have said not hoose, but house or hoose or perhaps house or something like that. And since then, they've moved up to the modern time. Time, sweet, clean. These two have formed together as the fleece vowel now. Name, stone, moon, house. Look, to remind you, this is what I used in... This is what I used in when I taught the history of the English language. Uh, if you look at the pronunciation in, Cha in Chaucer's time, that corresponds to the spelling. Nama is down here with a. Clan is here with a. Sweet is here with e. And teed is here with e. Okay? And in the back you've got stone here, which originally was stan in Old English. You've got moon, oo here. And you've got hus here. Alright? That's what happened, and the great vowel shift happens because what? Because all the vowels move up a little bit. This is the spelling in Old English. Nama, clan, sweet, teed, stan, mona, and hus. Okay? These two. No. Listen to this. Uh, these vowels are the cardinal vowels. They're not part of the language. Okay, this is the, this is the vowel chart which shows the vowel chart for all languages of the world. And if you go down them, e, e, a, 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 o, o, u. Here you you you're moving your tongue down from e, e, a, a, e, e, a, a. Here you're going up, but, uh, but in, in the European languages, most European languages, you also round your lips as you go up the back. So you get rounded vowels at the top here. A, A, O, U. Okay? That's, the, that's the, the vowel chart for all languages. And as I so often pointed out, it's great fun to think of it. There's one Icelandic word which starts here and goes down here and comes up here. Can you think what it is? Which word is that? Yow. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yow. Marvelous word. Marvelous word. And that will perhaps help you to remember this because you can say yow. Yeah. Huh? And it only needs two It only needs two letters, <laughs> yeah. Um, you, can, uh, you can remember that if you, if you can't remember what should be up here. You can start with yow. Helps an awful lot. So what happened was between 
1450 and 1600, and it went on after 1600, some other things happened, was that the vowels all started to move up. Now, why did they do that? You see, the word nam started to be pronounced nam. Clan started to be pronounced clean. Sweet started to be pronounced sweet. And the back here, storm started to be pronounced stoon. And moon started to be pronounced moon. So what happened to house and time, hoose and tea? They got pushed out. They got pushed off the vowel chart and they jumped over and became diphthongs. So teed changed into teed, 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 tied. And hoose changed into hoose, 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 hoose. And that movement is still going on with the diphthongs. Tide is, is now tied, it's still going on in London to be tie, tie, toy, toy, toy. It's the same movement going on. And then toy will go toy will go like tide. So you might think that tide will start being head. It will no tide let's let's look at let's look at let's look at sweet which is now sweet that's going that's following tide down in London people are saying sweet sweet it's very sweet oh yeah it's a nice trait 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 and it's changing into it's going the same it's following tide down that's that's diphthong shift what I'm wondering is that eventually tide will go down to the open there it can do all kinds of things. What's, hap what's happening is that it's becoming an, it's becoming monothongalizing. It's being tired, tired, tired. Yeah. In American, you wouldn't say the tired. The tired is coming in. Okay. But could it, could it become toy? Or toy? It, well, it, it has become toyed in London. And uh, the oi vowel has turned into ui in London. So you see, this is really in all languages. Vowels are all. It's, it's wandering around like 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 the geography of the world, like the, like the, 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 the yeah. It's all wandering around all the time, and we can, to some extent, we can um, we can uh, guess what's going to happen, but we never. That other things might happen. Other streams. For instance, let's ask each other. Why do they start moving up? Why didn't they start moving down? What happened? Why did they start moving up? Aren't there some that do move down? Yeah, these are moving down, they're falling over the top. But why did norm uh, change into name? Why didn't it go back to norm? Yeah, I'm wondering, aren't there dialects that move in the opposite direction? There are dialects, one or two dialects. When you come to the Scottish, you'll find that what happened to O is it moved in this direction and stopped pushing moon out of the way so that, that hoose out of the way so hoose stays there in Scottish and stone does something else hoose you can still you know you still got the, the, these old pronunciation of combatime hoose that's still there in Scottish so that in different dialects it, this, is the di this is what happens in southern English dialects Um, there are two things happening here which you can think of, and this is really a this is really something that uh, that linguists are still um, uh, still in disagreement about. It could be that one of these vowels starts moving and pushes the others out of the way, and that if that happens, we are talking about a push chain. Somewhere one vowel starts moving and because then words would come together and start merging and instead of not merging they move around. Or it could be that for instance the tida word started changing into taid and there was a, a space here and the vowels drifted up to fill the space and this would be a pull chain. 
And some people find it very important as to whether it was a push chain and a pull chain. Unfortunately, if you go into the history of English, you can find a lot of, um, a lot of um, reasons for, for thinking for both. That's right. A lot of reasons for both. The nicest reason, <coughs> we're finishing now, but I'm just going to mention the nicest reason I can, I can think of, <coughs> which sounds very good to me, is that in about the 14th century, there was a lot of a movement from the countryside into London, particularly from the Midlands. Now, if it had been that the countryside in the Midlands had higher vowels, had lower vowels than London, you'd find people moving in with higher vowels and the Londoners hearing that difference and wanting to move themselves away from them. Londoners wanting to say, we don't talk like that. We are Londoners. We don't talk like these, these country yokels. And moving their vowels away from them. Moving them up. Well, then it's the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I can't. No, I, yeah. It may be a social movement away from the pronunciation of the people, the, the, the people from the countryside, the Sweta men. Okay. The um, the paysan. That would explain a lot. Of course, people weren't actually saying, you know, my God, what his name is got very low foot vowel it sounds horrible to me I think I'll move it up to strut or something like that it was completely without thinking they didn't realize they were doing but that's the sort of thing that might have happened and I've seen a, a, an article which which points that out so that is that that is the uh, that is the, uh, the, 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 the the vowel shift uh, I think we've got to go on and look at the effects of the vowel shift next time we do this we'll stop here um, because, and, and ask ourselves why is it important for modern English well you can see it's important for modern English because of diphthong shift one th can I just before you go can I just point one thing out to you which I want you to I want you to reply to me on If you go into diphthong shifts here, perhaps you could do this for me and tell me and report back to me. Go into diphthong shifts. When you get into the diphthong shift, you get these little things here which you can play. Okay. Uh, I won't do that now. When I do it on my home computer, then I have to go into another program and, it, and you can't see this. Um, so what I've got is a, a, an embed version of the same, the same uh, picture, the same, the same um, site here. If you try the embed version, open that, you get this one. It looks exactly the same, except that you should be able to play them in place. Okay. The trouble with this is it takes a long time to download on a, if you're on the home computer, whereas the other one doesn't take such a long time to download. Could you try them both, please, and tell, tell me just which ones you find best? This old one, here's the... It opens up on a new thing here. But it may be, may be different on your computer. Hmm? It depends. Yeah, it depends on how you got your browser set up. That's all right. But in in this one, you've got it set up with uh, with an embed function, so that it comes into the whole thing, and it takes longer. I'd like you to know which of you which you prefer anyway. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. We'll stop there, and um, we'll start listening to the South of England and going on with the Great Vowel Shift on Wednesday.